ladies and gentlemen, I can only say one thing. Palantir. Palantir. Pala I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not going to do this. <laughs> Anyways, what a crazy ride we had yesterday. But first, I got to say good morning to the Daily Allegedly Squad. I've been seeing your comments, watching Daily. Thank you so much. My name is Tom. I'm your friendly former senior financial analyst, currently a full-time YouTuber. And in today's video, I want to give you a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the issues we did not get to cover yesterday. So here's the thing. You know, I don't want you to click nothing. I don't want you to smash nothing. I don't want you to buy or subscribe. Just give me your attention because I'm about to talk about important stuff. Now, I don't hold you hostage. So here are the topics in advance. And I'm going to give you the bottom line as well. So first of all, I will explain with a numerical example why Alex Carp is selling. The whole insider selling narrative of Alex Carp. I'm going to go through an entire numerical example showing you why he has no choice but to sell shares right now, even though he doesn't want to. And once I do that example with you step by step, within 30 seconds, you'll see. Because I explained it yesterday, but I feel it was very amorphic. It was very intangible, so to speak, right? I'm going to give you a numerical example to show you how the mechanics work that actually force him to sell. It's quite easy to see when you put in numbers. The other thing I feel we didn't get to cover yesterday is the quality of the financial results and the business results. We're going to go through the presentation and I'm going to show you everything they've done this quarter, which is nothing short of phenomenal. Now, in my video yesterday, I said they hit expectations because Frankly, expectations were very high, but that doesn't mean that what they did was not remarkable. If you look at their numbers deeply, like we're going to do in this video, by the way, I'm not sure deeply is an actual word, but as a Russian, I get to get away with that. If you go deep dive into the numbers, you're going to see that they're on a phenomenal path. And that I think was the contributing factor to the massive upswing we had yesterday, because a lot of these retail investors basically said, oh, damn. The stock is actually performing well. Wow, look at these numbers. So I think that we deserve a deeper dive into the actual numbers, the growth numbers, the financials. So if you're into Palantir and you want a little bit of a deeper dive, that's probably a better video for you today instead of just the actual numbers we all kind of know in here, more analytical. And here's another piece of news which is kind of interesting. While I was buying the dip and come to think of it, I should have used Kathy Wood in my thumbnail. <laughs> She was actually buying the dip as well. I bought about 10% more of Palantir to increase my holding. I mean, I love that company. She loves it even more. Yesterday, between RK and RW, she bought 2.8 million shares just yesterday. So I was buying my little 10%. She was going all in, mother lover. I mean, that was crazy. Nothing more to say about that. I mean, we know she loves the company. It seems like it's becoming slowly one of her high conviction stocks. She said that once things go a little bit wide, and the tech sector will call off. She'll be consolidating. It seems that she's basically consolidating into Tesla, Palantir, and a few other companies, which is quite interesting, but doesn't really justify a whole video, uh, let alone a whole thumbnail about that. So we're going to keep it professional. No clickbait, Kathy, today. So check this out. So first of all, the numerical example of why Alex Carp absolutely has to sell his stock. Check this out. So whenever you have a professional CEO or somebody you want to retain in the company, it's very customary to give them a package not that kind of package, get your head out of the gutter, package of options. Essentially, every quarter you have a certain amount that's awarded to you. And as the price of the stock of the company keeps going up, that option is actually worth more. Now, as the stock keeps going up, the original price at which he got the options, let's say 100 price per share, is now differentiated versus the market price, let's say 200 per share. So he has that benefit built in. And at this point, you might say, well, that's a benefit. He has a built-in discount to buy shares at less than the market price. Phenomenal. Well, not exactly, because every ESOP grant, ESOP meaning employee stock options, essentially you have an expiration date. They come with strings attached. You got to exercise by a certain date. Otherwise, these options will expire. That's very normal. However, when you get to the expiration date, you have a decision to make because you have to pay $100 to exercise that based on our example, right? But wait, there's more. You got to pay tax. Now, when you have a 200 price per share and the actual exercise price is 100, you already have $100 built in as taxable income. 
Essentially, that is capital gains. And if the long-term capital gains rate in the US is 20%, which it is, then you have another $20 to pay. And here's the case. You just spent $100 per share, including the $20 for tax and another $100 to exercise these options since you don't have a choice since they're about to expire. But you had $0 coming in, so no money to actually pay for this. So you got to sell shares just to pay for these option grants. And that's unfortunately for the Palantir shorts and the haters, that's the sole reason Alex Carr has been selling shares. However, if you take a look at the sales numbers, he's still holding about 80 to 90% of the shares. He didn't really sell off. Neither did Peter Thiel. I mean, that's just nonsense. So in general, the whole narrative of insider selling is now completely debunked after the Q1 call. And I absolutely love that. Now, let's go over the presentation because there's a lot to cover there. But the first thing I want to show you here, which is quite interesting, is the adjusted operating income. The company had adjusted operating income of 116 million in Q1 2021. And if you compare that to the number they had in the entire 2020 year, they already reached 61% of the entire net income of last year in a single quarter. Now, these numbers, when you give them that context, mean a lot because 116 is just a number, right? But when you did 190 through the entire year last year, you already did 116 in one quarter. That means a lot. And again, in these videos, I don't want to just read off the page. I want to give you extra context so you actually get the full picture, not just these numbers. So check this out. Now, first of all, this number in itself is quite impressive. 44% adjusted free cash flow margin. That is wild. However, that's even more interesting. Look at the path they went through. So they lost 300 million in cash flow in Q1 2020. However, they made 151 this quarter. So that means they shifted from losing 300 million in cash burn rate, right? From the first quarter of last year, they went from losing cash, losing, burning, whatever you want to call it, 300 million per quarter last year in Q1 2020 to making 150 per quarter positive as far as cash flow. That happened in a single year. And honestly, I can think of a lot of companies that can make this happen going from negative 300 to positive 151 quarter over quarter, year over year. That is Tesla level numbers or Tesla level improvement, whatever you want to call it. Not saying that this is Tesla. I'm saying this is hell impressive. Now, this number, everybody expected their revenues grew by 50 percent versus Q1 2020. Now, because it was kind of anticipated, people tend to overlook how impressive that is. You got 50 percent growth in revenue quarter over quarter, year over year, which is nothing to be ashamed of. That number is phenomenal from 230 to 340, not to mention that they actually beat the expectations by about 10 million. But that's a really impressive growth. But wait, there's more. Now, this slide is impressive on many levels. First of all, most companies won't share this data because it's too complex, but they actually did. Beyond the fact that this number is insane. So their billings per quarter grew from 104 to 362. Now, just when you think that billings is some sort of a technical thing, it's not. Getting people to pay you what they owe you is not that easy. It takes a lot of work. And it actually shows a lot about the quality of customers you're working with. If you're able to increase your billings from 104 to 362 year over year, quarter over quarter, that means that A, you know how to do your job as far as billing. Number two, that your clientele is triple A. The only way to get this amount of growth in billing is by having phenomenal clients and a really good team. That means a lot to me, even though a lot of people will overlook this number. Now, this number is not that impressive to me. I know a lot of people will say, well, that's 81% year over year growth in the US revenue. That's fine, but you have a lot of concentration here. That means that if you grew 49% globally and 81% in the US, that means that the US is essentially where your powerhouse is. I'd like to see this company go global. And that means that this high number is actually a sign that they're not there yet. I'm not saying that they won't be. Yes, you know me, I'm a huge bull, but I'm saying 81% when the entire growth is 49, that means you have a lot of work to do internationally. And that's fine. I think they're definitely on the path, but I'm not going to be sitting here and, you know, just licking their bum because I like the company. I'm going to be pointing out the things that I don't like. And 81%, given that 49 is the entire global ROW, that means that this number is way too high for my taste. It definitely needs to be spread around more evenly. Now, this slide, as impressive as it is, it's nothing to write home about because A, we anticipated that, and B, we know that they're very strong with governments. We're looking at the commercial side. This thing 
not surprising. They're probably going to do the same percentage next year and next quarter. They're very good with governments, especially with the U.S. government. So that part, we got it covered. That's the basis. We want to see the growth in the commercial actually hit these numbers, the 76 to 80 percent. That's still not there yet. This is actually also very interesting. That's the backlog. Essentially, they have 5.4 billion in total remaining deal value. That means that's cash flow they're going to collect on the next few years on project they still haven't collected on. That means a lot as far as their growth. Imagine having a business that actually gives you 5.4 billion of deal flow when your entire revenue for Q1 was 340 million. Imagine how massive their future is. This is insane. Now, this is where I want to see more improvement. Total commercial growth, 20%, which is very nice, but nothing I would say, wow, that's amazing. We want to see higher growth here. This is the commercial customers. So 19%, that's very nice, but look at this. 72% came from U.S. commercial customers. We got to see more global. We got to see more commercial and we got to see a better spread, not just 150 customers. We got to see this thing go scalable. That's the main stepping stone these guys have to go through. So for me, that number is nice, but nothing outrageous. This thing, even though it looks great, I think it's a sign of weakness because it essentially says that the top 20 customers are generating 34% more. That means high dependency in your biggest 20 customers, which is something I don't want to see. I definitely want to see revenue per customer go up, but I don't want to see the company become so heavily dependent in the top 20 customers because again that makes it look more like a consultancy and not as a scalable business which i'm sure it's not i'm sure it's a scalable business but these numbers are definitely something they need to work on now this is wow now if you want to talk about wow moments this is it 83 percent adjusted gross margin Contribution margin equally as impressive with 60%. By the way, contribution margin is essentially also when you take out the variables. So all the variable costs come down, still 60% margin. Wow, that's very impressive. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, nothing fanboyish. I told you the good, I told you the bad, where they need to improve, where they were really impressive. And in general, my total impression based on that. As always, a huge thanks for our channel members and our patrons. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. We'll see you guys in the next video.